Hi, everybody. As David said, my name is Chris Babbitts. I'm assistant director of the Cyberlaw Clinic, which is based at the Berkman Center and here at HLS. And we are um, uh, kind of a traditional legal law school clinic. Our students work on a wide range of issues involving technology, intellectual property, speech, privacy, youth online safety. We have a, uh, a number of our clients in the room today, so I'm thrilled they're here, as well as some of our students, which is great. Um, for those who follow news about the news, you know that today's topic of the topic of this first panel is just about as, as hot a topic as you can get. We're going to talk about a wide range of issues relating to news aggregation websites, about websites that compile and link to news stories that are found uh, from, from third party sources. Um, the parties that engage in news aggregation really run the gamut, including everyone from pure sort of spam blogs or splogs that people would say, um, up to sort of citizen journalists covering hyper-local issues and bringing in third-party content to supplement their own content, all the way up to major news organizations. And, and I think our panelists today represent this sort of diverse range of views and the types of parties that are involved in these kinds of activities. Um, we're going to talk, like I said, about the, the sort of two major legal doctrines, I think, that are involved in this. One is copyright and one is uh, the doctrine of hot news misappropriation, as well as some of the business issues that relate to this. So I'll give a really quick introduction to, to our five panelists who are crammed in at a very small table. And um, uh, I think after I give them a short introduction, I'm ask each of them down the line and talk for a couple minutes just about themselves and their practice and, and sort of how, how they come at the kinds of issues we're talking about today. Um, on my left is Mike Greigel, who's a partner at Hiscock and Barclay, and he's chair of the firm's media and First Amendment law practice. He also currently serves as chair of the New York State Bar Association's Committee on Media Law. His practice covers First Amendment issues, defamation, uh, advertising, copyright, reporters, subpoena matters, and his clients include Clear Channel Communications, Bloomberg, Condé Nast, and Gatehouse Media, whom Mike uh, represented in a case that I think a lot of people in the were probably follow following when it was filed uh, in, at the end of 2008 against the New York Times relating to um, the Boston Globe's use of headlines and needs leads from uh, stories found on Gatehouse's uh, Wicked Local series of blogs. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, right after Mike, we have Sam Byard. Sam's a fellow at the Berkman Center, and he's assistant director, works with David uh, at the Citizen Media Law Project. Sam's also a lecturer on law and the LLM program here at Harvard <coughs> Law School. Um, if you are familiar with the Citizen Media Law Project, uh, website, you know that they have a fantastic blog, and, and Sam's a, a frequent uh, a blogger on media law and intellectual property uh, issues of importance to non-traditional journalists and others. Um, Sam was an associate at Wachtell Lipton and clerk for Judge Kaplan in the Southern District of New York. Thanks for joining us, Sam. Um, after Sam, we have David Haas. David's a partner in Goodwin Proctor's litigation department here in Boston and, and a member of its intellectual property group. David's practice focuses on trademark, trade secret, copyright, false advertising, and licensing disputes. And David represented the New York Times Company in the aforementioned case uh, brought by Gatehouse uh, at the end of 2008. David, thanks for joining us. Um, after David, we have Bruce Brown. Bruce um, uh, uh, came and joined us on about, I guess, 40 hours notice, <laughs> roughly, um, from DC as a partner at Baker and Hostetler. And we're thrilled that he was able to make the trip. Um, Bruce's practice covers the areas of libel and invasion of privacy defense, copyright, law of news gathering. He has a long journalism background in addition to his legal career. He's been co-chair of the Legislative Affairs Committee of the MLRC in New York, and he's currently an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown's master's program in professional studies and journalism. Uh, along with some of his colleagues, including Bruce Stanford, uh, Bruce has published a number of pieces about news aggregation and related issues, including an op-ed that appeared in the Washington Post last May entitled Laws That Could Save Journalism. And thanks again, Bruce, for coming, especially on such short notice. And finally, Joseph Liu is a professor at Boston College Law School. Joseph uh, writes and teaches in the areas of copyright, trademark, and internet law. He's a co-author of uh, the copy Copyright Law Essential Cases and Materials textbook published by West. And the particular focus of Professor Liu's work is how digital technology is changing the ways in which consumers interact with copyrighted works, which I think is at the heart of a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, as I said, it's my goal to probably do as little talking as possible today. So I wonder if maybe each of you could start with a short statement about yourselves and, and, and what brings you here. Thanks so much. Mike, if you want to start. Thank you, Chris. And I, too, would like to uh, uh, join in thanking Chris Babbitts, <coughs> Jennifer Isbell, David Ardia, and the others at the Berkman Center for uh, organizing this event today. It certainly is uh, going to present some cutting edge and very interesting, uh, developing, fast developing um, legal issues. Uh, as Chris indicated, I chair the First Amendment in media law practice in my firm. Uh, these days, that means I spend an awful lot of time on airplanes. Um, uh, I'd like to think much to my wife's dismay, although I'm sometimes not certain. Uh, we do a lot of work in what I call traditional, uh, older media uh, types of claims, defamation, although those certainly can uh, affect internet publications as well, invasion of privacy, uh, and other news gathering and news publication 
related claims. Um, I would like to say that as somebody who has spent his entire professional career, I've been privileged to do so, uh, representing the media and the working press, uh, I have always viewed uh, the fair use doctrine as not some grudgingly tolerated exception, uh, but a fundamental policy uh, of the copyright law that is intended, and often does, uh, stimulate creative thought and authorship for the greater good and benefit of society. Uh, simply because I have taken the uh, pro-right holder view in a couple high-profile litigations, um, I will say for this group that my view has not changed uh, in, in that <laughs> regard. Uh, I'm sure we'll anticipate the uh, substantive discussion a little bit, but uh, and see if that can be squared up going forward. Um, the last thing I should add by way of uh, humor is when I told my children uh, that this was, was going to be uh, on a webcast, um, and I was walking out the door, they said, well, Dad, please, do us a favor. Just don't say anything really foolish. Uh, unfortunately, I, I could not provide them that reassurance. So, um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hi, um, oh, I'm Sam Byard, and I'm the assistant director of the Citizen Media Law Project. Um, so I'm sort of the in-house uh, guy uh, from the CMLP today. Um, and our, our sort of background on this um, and approach to it ha has been um, a, a concern uh, for sort of uh, the, the non-mainstream media. Um, journalist, the non-traditional journalist, the blogger, uh, the social media user, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we've been very interested in this topic of news aggregation uh, for a number of years, probably going back uh, uh, before the Gatehouse case, but uh, obviously our interest was spurred in that uh, at that point um, to sort of really engage with it. Um, and I, I think our orientation to the issue um, is that uh, um, uh, on the on the on the uh, copyright issue, on the fair use issue, we uh, we want to emphasize, I think that uh, that there are lots of different types of activities that that are are referred to under the label of news aggregation, uh, and that depending on what activities we're talking about, uh, the fair use analysis analysis certainly um, should come out differently, um, and that most of the more productive uh, uh, aggregation practices. Um, uh, uh, sh should, uh, under present law, um, enjoy the protection uh, of, of fair use. Um, hot news is something we've become very, very interested in uh, recently, um, and in particular, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the interest in, in, in what impact the hot news doctrine, um, uh, if expanded and revived and applied to uh, the online, sort of the open internet that we uh, that, that we enjoy today in the United States, what impact the hot news doctrine might have uh, on, uh, uh, on that sort of vibrant uh, conversation that's going on and what the First Amendment implications are uh, for that expansion. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's my take. We'll talk more. That's great. David? Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you to those of you who are online. Um, and thank you for the center for putting this together. This really is uh, a lot of fun, and I've been looking forward to this um, for a while now. Um, in some ways, I think I may approach these issues a little bit differently than um, some of the other panelists and probably from some of the other folks in the room. I come to these issues not in a sense from a media or an industry perspective. Um, I really have spent my life as an intellectual property lawyer, um, I, as a result, have been dragged into many, many different media disputes, and uh, including the New York Times case, and, and um, uh, I also represented Cablevision uh, at the trial level in the RSDVR case that they had against um, most of the media industry um, a number of years back that ultimately was decided the right way in, in the Second Circuit. Um, and so I, I really sort of do come from come at these issues from a, a very traditional um, intellectual property bent, um, and that's where my analysis tends to start. Um, obviously, that analysis can be um, seen through the prism of, of various different clients that I've had, um, and many of them are in the in the media industry, including the New York Times and Cablevision, and um, uh, uh, some very interesting. 
uh, clients um, who have been involved in publishing um, uh, and both as authors and as publishers. I represented Hamid Karzai at one point when he got into a, an odd issue over a book deal. Um, and uh, I also, in a sense, um, come to this from a, from a slightly different angle uh, in the sense that when it comes to watching um, the media world change <coughs> and content provision change, uh, I have a vested interest in it. Uh, I'm, uh, my day job is as a uh, lawyer. I'm also a novelist, and I've had four novels published around the world in nine different languages. And um, watching uh, watching the industry change and trying to figure out how content is going to be protected um, and encouraged uh, is not just a professional interest to me, but a, but a personal interest. The latest book, by the way, is called Among Thieves. came out a bump, about a month and a half ago. <laughs> got great reviews. If you guys like thrillers, please. I need, I need the money, so <laughs> go on, buy it. Bruce? Great. Well, I guess I've been looking forward to this for about 36 hours. Um, <laughs> um, but it's great to be here, and it's great to be a sub, because um, clearly I can take a pass on the tough questions, because I didn't have a chance to do any of the homework. Um, just to get my biases out on the table, um, I worked in, um, in, in print media before I went to law school. I worked for David Broder at the Washington Post for a couple of years and then did some stringing for The Economist when I was in law school. And then after law school, um, I worked at uh, American Lawyer Media at Legal Times um, down in Washington where I wrote about the federal courts. Um, uh, so I have a, a print media background that's going to give me a bias. My clients are in print media. That's going to give me a bias. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have a Gmail account. Um, I've never been on Twitter. Um, my poet is still Yeats. My band is still the Beatles. I am clearly of the old century. Um, but saying all that, I love the internet, um, but I love journalism. And so one of the things that I've been working on over the last couple of years is trying to do some writing about what we can do in the way of public policy uh, to help journalism survive the transition to the online world. And when it comes to hot news, uh, my colleague, Bruce Sanford, and I, as Chris mentioned, uh, did a, a piece last year where we looked at some of the different things that Congress might be able to do um, to give journalism a boost uh, online. And we felt that there had been a lot of attention in the 90s to what tech needed in the way of public policy. It got the Communications Decency Act. It got the DMCA. And, um, and now it was time to give some thought about what uh, could be done for journalism. And when it comes to hot news, um, we would like to see an expansion of the hot news doctrine. It is a, is a doctrine that exists in just a handful of states now, and we are in favor of uh, federalizing it. Um, but at the same time, we believe it is a doctrine um, that should be used sparingly and um, uh, for only those situations where there truly is a, a systemic uh, free writing uh, on the hard work that journalists do uh, to put out the knowledge we all need on the internet. And that we, can, we believe that we can federalize hot news, make it available um, nationwide and not just in the handful of states where it currently exists today. And that that, we believe as First Amendment lawyers, would be consistent with um, keeping the internet um, the vibrant speech community that we all very much want it to be. Thanks for being here. Joseph? So, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Joe Liu. I'm a professor at uh, Boston College Law School. Um, and I want to offer my thanks, too, to the center for uh, putting together this terrific panel. I think it's a really fascinating topic. Uh, I also want to congratulate the center on uh, launching uh, the, uh, the initiative. Uh, I think it's a great uh, idea, and I wish you the best of success with it. Um, so uh, my main area of focus in research is copyright law. Um, and in particular, I study how rapid changes in digital technology are changing the way in which consumers interact with copyright works in terms of getting even more access to them, being able to manipulate them, send them to other TV people, transform them and all the rest. Uh, and in particular, how existing laws you know, facilitate or hinder these kinds of efforts. Now, um, I think this is relevant to the topic for today because um, I think it's pretty dramatic the changing nature of the patterns in which consumers consume news. Uh, I'm actually old enough to remember the days when you had to wait for the uh, afternoon edition of the newspaper uh, or the evening broadcast to find out what happened during the day. Um, things are incredibly different today. Uh, the amount of uh, information that's available, the media.
GSC, the number of sources that it's coming from. Um, and so a lot of the same questions that I look at applied to other industries um, are relevant here. Um, so a lot of the same questions about what role should intellectual property law play, copyright, hot news disappropriation, uh, to what extent will it facilitate changing patterns of uh, interacting with the news, producing the news, uh, and all the rest. Um, as an aside, I was talking to Bruce earlier, I think it's really interesting that um, as a copyright scholar, uh, you know, so much attention has been focused on the impact on uh, the recording industry, the movie industry, how are these industries going to survive, um, and at least for copyright scholars, uh, the impact on the newspaper industry kind of snuck up on us. You know, so we were kind of looking in one direction, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a crisis in the news. Uh, and so I think uh, it's interesting applying a lot of the same issues uh, to this kind of uh, problem. Um, uh, and so, you know, my approach, and I guess my uh, interest in this issue, uh, will be as, uh, I guess, kind of the designated uh, pointy-headed uh, academic on the panel. Uh, and so from that perspective, I think, um, you know, a lot of the other folks on the panel will, uh, I think, have a lot of great things to say about the real-world impact of a lot of these rules, how to manage the parties and all the rest. Um, I guess my contribution, uh, to the extent that I have one, uh, will be to try to, you know, kind of offer a little bit more of a broader perspective, a little bit more of a historical perspective. Um, and on that front, you know, let me just kind of throw two things out here. Um, uh, I think one of them will probably not get a good reception on this panel. Uh, but this idea that, you know, from a broader perspective, um, we should rightly worry about the viability of the news and making sure that people are producing the news and all the rest. Um, but maybe we should be less worried about the viability of newspapers uh, and traditional media. Uh, that, uh, and I know, again, uh, I'm not sure this is not terribly happy to some of the other uh, panelists on, the, on this panel. Uh, but that we should be concerned, but only to the extent that they're necessary to produce the news. And in some cases, they may well be, um, play an important role, but in other cases, they may not. And I think it's important to be very careful about uh, making sure that the target is the production of news and how we make sure that the news is produced. Um, and then the second point, I guess, just to again throw out there, would be um, just in responding to these challenges, uh, to be kind of appropriately cautious about the ability of uh, legislators and courts uh, to really craft uh, responses uh, that work in the way that we intend them to work. Uh, I think there's a lot of history about attempts to anticipate technologies, anticipate markets, um, and I think uh, we need to be very careful about that, especially in an environment that is so dynamic where things are changing a lot. Uh, not to say that it shouldn't be done, but just that we have to have an appropriate level of care. So, uh, that's great. I, mean, I, I have a few issues I could throw out, but I think Joe's thrown out two to begin with. I don't know, does anyone want to respond to, to either of his, his points? If I understood it, uh, Joe, the, the first question goes to the uh, uh, ongoing uh, viability of the institutionalized media as a content provider. And certainly the internet has changed the environment, the news environment. Uh, there are many more sources of news information rapidly, indeed, instantaneously delivered. Um, however, uh, the caveat, perhaps even bordering on admonition, that I would make is that uh, to deliver the news, and by that I mean uh, accurate, uh, truthful, concise, insightful information that is of utility to all members of the society and would promote uh, the values perhaps most expressly identified in First Amendment jurisprudence in some of the access cases from the early 1980s. And I'm thinking specifically of, uh, to some degree, Chief, Judge, Chief Justice uh, Berger's majority in the Richmond newspapers case, certainly Justice Brennan's concurrence about the structural value of people uh, in the news industry who present information that really makes citizens' ability uh, to function properly in a democracy um, a viable construct. That is a very important function and service protected under the First Amendment. My concern is that if we don't have, uh, and I'm not looking for a special pleading uh, for the institutionalized press, but in my experience, and I'll make somewhat of a cautious judgment, it is the working institutionalized press that still performs that function. There are some exceptions, uh, but ad hoc, uh, more off-the-cuff commentary uh, is of a different order. Um, I know this, there's uh, intrinsically a value judgment that I'm, I'm making here. I'm prepared to stand by it. And I think to get that type of news requires training, discipline, hard work, cultivation of resources, investment of time and effort. I, I guess I would kind of loop back to your second point and say, 
even if that's true, does that do, do we need legislative fixes? Or does this, uh, Professor Lou sort of caution and his second point I think was about what, about being some concern having some concern about legislative fixes to these problems. Again, I'm thinking about these two buckets of issues, copyright and hot news. I don't know if we want to start with copyright, but are there do, do we does, does the existing uh, set of copyright laws we have in this country not protect the the, the, the kinds of industry that that, that, that that Mike just mentioned? Well, I mean, before we get to the, the legal analysis, it seems to me in terms of um, analyzing the business model and how we address all of that, I mean, you know, there has been in the traditional media um, from, you know, my observation, <clears throat> somewhat of a monopoly in the sense that there was an, this enormous barrier to entry for other players, which was the distribution aspect. Um, and that really has gone down. I, again, coming back to sort of the intellectual property aspect to it, look at it and wonder, okay, how is it that we do protect it and how do we monetize it? To some degree, because the, the, the barrier to entry is low at this point, there's a new barrier to entry, I think, though, that again, when you talk about the value of the information, the value is in the accuracy. The value is in the hard work that's done underlying the reporting itself. It seems to me that, that in the future you're going to see, inevitably, um, trademarks actually playing more and more of a role in terms of adding value to those who produce the news. Because what you're going to see is people are going to look for the sources that they actually trust. Uh, before they had to pay for the distribution, but now what they're looking for is the name. If, you, if it's coming from the New York Times, are you more likely to trust it, and therefore are you more likely to go to their website? Are you more likely to trust, trust Fox or CNN? You're also going to see a branding, and you've already seen this, not only online, but, but in terms of the network and the, and the, um, uh, the cable net news networks, a branding in terms of ideology. You see that online, you see that on television. Again, a lot of this comes um, not now from the copyright aspect, but from the trademark aspect. And that's, to some degree, what's driving viewership and eyeballs. Okay, just to pick up on a couple of things. Um, you asked about the lack of clarity in the law, or do we need more protections. I, I do think when we get to talking about the Gatehouse Media case, that's a great example of where you looked at the situation, you thought, well, is this copyright? Um, is it hot news? You know, we're still early enough in figuring out how these two doctrines relate to each other that um, uh, there may be cases that aren't quite perfect copyright cases and maybe they might belong um, in hot news. Um, and then we've got Feist out there and the loss of sweat of the brow and that affects, affects the picture. Um, I would say in response to Joe's comment that um, uh, certainly there are some who think that codification of hot news brings a risk because you're locking in a test uh, when perhaps what we want is to give courts more of a common law freedom to develop the law. Um, my partner David Marburger in, in Cleveland has written about um, clarifying that copyright shouldn't preempt uh, hot news in the states and then letting the hot news doctrine um, develop in the states. That's another way to go if you, do, if you are uncomfortable with the idea of, of actually codifying the Motorola factors, for example, in a, in a federal um, hot news law. And I do think when the press, um, the institutional press, uh, pushes these issues uh, as a legislative matter, that it is important to remember that, at least as a matter of constitutional law, when we push the preferred position under the First Amendment in the 70s, that we were unsuccessful in that area. And that what we're, we need to kind of broaden the way we think about some of these issues and, and um, really couch them as protections that would apply to any industry that puts out information that requires uh, resources to gather information and then publish it. Uh, in the hot news area, we'll get to it. The last big case we'll all talk about was brought by investment banks, not exactly uh, the, the lobbying colleagues we thought we might have for expanding the hot news doctrine. Um, but there it is. And, um, and the case we all look to, the Motorola case, for what the factors are for hot news, of course, was brought by a, a sports franchise. So there are other industries that are interested in the protection of information. Um, I'd just like to pick up um, on Joe's point a little bit about the business model stuff before we get into the doctrine and just raise the, the possibility, um, or well, first to say that I totally agree with you that um, 
as a, a social good that investigative journalism, uh, that uh, accountability journalism, these, these are, I don't think anyone's questioning that these are uh, important social goods that we should figure out as a society some way to support and sustain, right? Um, but, but I do want to raise the possibility that I, I'm not sure that what ails the news business right now um, can be fixed uh, by, by dealing with this problem of free riding or appropriation. Um, uh, as you say, there's, there's an issue of um, the monopoly, uh, the, the whole, the, the whole um, sort of business model of the 20th century that was built on extracting monopoly rents and, and uh, local papers that were one town, uh, one paper towns. And there are tons of different uh, sort of forces at play that may be causing these problems. And, and maybe we can, we can raise this today, and maybe you guys can point out, where, is there empirical evidence that's showing that what ails the news industry and what's causing uh, the problems is uh, news aggregation or, or bloggers or spam blogs. Is that really the economic problem or is there a bigger economic problem that we as a society have to face rather than trying to, to fix it through intellectual property law? Just to chime in really quickly on that last point, I think um, one of the things that to me is so fascinating about this topic is that when you contrast it to other industries that are under pressure, like the copyright industry, uh, sorry, the movie industry, the music industry, uh, which have kind of faced this issue maybe you know a couple years ahead of the newspaper industry and the broadcast media industry, um, that you know the, the the threat there was a lot more immediate. Right, you could kind of see what's happening. It's the you know the college student with a lot of time on his or her hands with access to like BitTorrent uh, and uh, Napster, right? Uh, and it was a very easy story uh, that you know, people are downloading and not paying. Um, but the newspapers, I think it's, it's much more fascinating because it's, it's so complex. Um, there are a lot of things happening to the newspaper industry. Uh, the impact, part of it might be the lack of intellectual property protection, but it might be other pressures that are facing it. Um, you know, kind of the peeling away of classified advertising by Craigslist, Craigslist right? Yeah. Uh, completely unrelated in some ways to copyright. Um, and so there are a lot of things going on, so I think it's harder to diagnose what's happening, and it's harder also to see the way through, right, and what the future of this industry is going to look like, I think, is quite uncertain. Well, and it, you, you can also see that in terms of the way the disputes arise, because you would think that there would be an industry position and a non-industry position, or maybe a traditional industry position and a, and a, you know, new media position, but that's really not the way that it breaks down. I mean, in the case that, that Mike and I were on opposite sides, um, on, you know, uh, we represented, I represented the New York Times, which obviously is one of the sort of uh, pillars of, of the old established media. And yet, we were the defendants in that case uh, because the, the New York Times and the Boston Globe functions both as a traditional media provider, but also engages in um, linking, engages in news aggregation. And so, you really sort of um, have this disconnect um, and, and this difficulty in necessarily predicting who it is that's going to be on what side of which dispute. And, and the, the disputes end up being so factually driven um, that, it's, that it's sometimes difficult to draw out larger principles from them. No, I, I agree with that. I think the lines do blur. And uh, I think, Sam, you just, in a very uh, comprehensive, articulate way, set forth the uh, global problems about the industry business model. Uh, if you could answer the question you posed, you can make an awful lot of money as a consultant, um, because a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about this. But I do agree with Dave. I mean, all um, media companies today are not just uh, uh, originators of content, but they are also aggregators you know, to some considerable degree of content. So the lines do tend to blur a little bit. And just to add to, add to that, I was mentioned to Joe before the panel started that in talking to a friend at the Washington Post um, over the weekend, he had said that you, you re literally have a situation where half the newsroom wants to just turn Google off, and then on the other half of the newsroom, there are people who call Google and Yahoo every day to try to get their stories up at the top uh, of the aggregators list. So there is this real schizophrenia um, in the industry. And, but I do think that there is a place for hot news but perhaps less in the context of, uh, of media companies suing each other, because I think we wouldn't see a lot of that. I thought the Gatehouse case was unusual in that way. But maybe it does have a place for um, a, a company that, um, that is 
putting a lot of content out there, going after someone who's putting no content into the system at all, and is simply just scraping the content that someone else is um, putting on the net. And I think the fly on the wall decision is sort of interesting because one of the things the court looked at was whether fly on the wall did any kind of original information gathering and news gathering on its own. And even though you, it's not quite clear you know, how that fits into the Motorola test, it was, it was used by that court and it was a factor in its decision. And I think in any use of the journalism industry of the hot news doctrine, I think the plaintiffs would pick their cases very carefully they'd pick the cases they would win, right? They would pick the cases mostly where they felt they were going after organizations that were just standing outside the door, metaphorically here, and just taking your content, linking to it, selling ads around it. Um, I would just add one thing to that, which is a sort of, you mentioned that like some, uh, some news organizations will be calling Google up because they want Google to pick it up. Um, there's also the flip side of the, the situation, which is I think, news, I think reporters are using uh, the internet and they're using this sort of distributed news gathering sort of tool that it offers as a way of, of also creating stories. And so I, I think it was Jamie Boyle, who's a, a New York Law School professor, um, uh, had this example in a talk he gave the other day where he's saying, what about the New York Times uh, writer or reporter who speaks Spanish and reads uh, the uh, a Chilean newspaper's account of, of some event that's going on in Chile and then rewrites it for the New York Times and publishes it. There we, get, we got two productive um, sort of activities going on there. So sometimes it might not be as easy to say, well, one is the productive, analytical, investigative source, and the other is the free writing, you know, does nothing spam blog. But just to respond to that quickly, you know, I think that's just sort of a a straw man he's throwing out there because no one is going to be suing over that. But I'm not sure that we should feel comfortable with the promise of, 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 well, you know, we're going to be restrained and the news organizations aren't going to sue people that they, that's a lot of discretion. Yeah, but one, let's not forget in Motorola, the NBA lost. I mean, the, you know, right. the, yeah. um, and, but I think that when people throw out examples like that, it doesn't reflect the reality of how the, the doctrine would be used, where I think companies would carefully look at situations where systemically over a period of time there was a, a widespread pattern uh, by an organization that probably doesn't do any news gathering itself. Um, and so there was an example, big outlook piece about six months ago, Washington Post reporter really upset that Gawker had taken one of his stories yeah, and had repackaged that, yeah. it and got a lot of attention, that story did. But um, it was in New York. Gawker's based in New York. The Washington Post could go after Gawker in New York because it's one of the state that, states that recognizes hot news. But of course they wouldn't do that because Gawker is not the kind of company that you're going to. This is, this is and it's a one time. with the test is that it, you, you don't know who's a competitor and who's serious enough. And, and, and that, to me, creates at least some speech issues because you have people guessing whether they're a serious enough competitor. You have people guessing whether their activity is systematic enough. And is it analytic enough? Is it productive enough? You know. it's, yeah, it, it also strikes me that one of the problems that you're going to face, and you face this both in the copyright context and, and in the hot news context, because ultimately, when you look at fair use and hot news, there is, in both instances, this issue of, What's the real impact? What's the economic impact? Um, and that, to me, particularly in a world that's developing um, technology as quickly as we are, evaluating what the, that impact is going to be is going to be very difficult on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, take, for example, the news aggregation system, where it really depends on what, what you're doing. The fly on the wall case, to me, isn't really what I think of as a news aggregation case at all. There was no linking involved to that at all. I think of uh, an aggregator, you know, and there are a thousand different definitions, but my own personal one is an aggregator is someone who is providing a headline, a notation, something to somebody else's story, but then linking back to that story. And, and there is this significant question of what is the value that that person is taking and what is the value that that, that, that person is providing back to the original source. And so, and, you know, as technologies develop quickly, 
you know, linking is, is today's issue, but there's going to be a new issue tomorrow, and, and assessing the, the long-term economic impacts of that in the context of a litigation are very, very difficult to do. I think a situation where, for example, you know, as in fly on the wall, somebody simply taking um, a piece of news, and I actually don't entirely agree with the fly on the wall decision in a couple of acts, but take, take a situation where someone is actually just taking the news and summarizing, putting it on their site without a link back to anybody else right. that they're taking it from. That, I think, is pro probably an easier case because there you, you have a more clear example of competition because nothing's going, nothing is going back to the original creator. Um, but there are going to be situations um, where the value of this is difficult to, anal to analyze, again, both in the copyright context and in the hot news context. Hey, just following up on that really quickly, um, I guess a question for you know Bruce, David, and Mike, uh, Mike um, about exactly this issue, kind of the economic impact of the linking. Um, and the reason I find that really interesting is because um, you know, the linking cases do seem different from your misappropriation cases for exactly the reason that David mentioned, right? That in INS versus AP, in NBA versus Motorola, even in the final wall case, you're taking someone else's information, uh, you know changing it around, sending it out to the world. Uh, the linking cases, though, um, where's the misappropriation, right? Um, you're linking to stuff. So in some sense, you're directing traffic to that site. But it's not like you're taking the news uh, and then reselling it, right? Um, you're just linking to the original page. You might be misappropriating the headlines, and I understand that. That's a different kind of issue. But how are you misappropriating the news? Um, Where's the misappropriation there? Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a little harder fit on the facts for the mis uh, hot news misappropriation <laughs> doctrine. But I think, again, context matters. Uh, and if it is something that's repeated seriatim and there is a vast panoply of another news organization's content, uh, even if it's just a headline uh, and a lead that is linked to, uh, then again, I think it's a, a, a closer call on even hot news misappropriation. Um, and it also raises some interesting uh, fair use questions. Um, but I, I think uh, the short and the long answer to the economics, it seems to me, is with, with the linking, and um, I don't think anybody on any side of the question really feels that there is uh, anything inherently problematic or unlawful uh, to linking alone. Uh, but who's making the money now? Um, news organizations have repeatedly had difficulty monetizing their content. Uh, Google News and Google are certainly making an awful lot of money. Um, so at least in a large level global sense, um, I think that that does to some degree at least frame the economic question, if not answer it. Does it undercut the incentives, though? I guess that's the question that I have, which is, um, as an economic matter, I can understand why you'd want to direct folks to your homepage, because you, know, you can sell ads and they're more sure. pricey and all the rest, right? Absolutely. Um, but one of the issues, I guess, in NBA versus Motorola is whether this kind of free riding, let's assume it's free riding, would so undercut the incentives that it would really have a material effect on the production of that information. Um, and this is just a question I just don't know the answer to. Is whether, is there a business model where you could sell the ads on the individual pages for enough, you know, more to make up for the fact that you're losing um, hits on your homepage and the additional traffic that's being driven to those pages makes up for it. I mean, this is just well, well, if, if, if that proof were demonstrated in an individual case, uh, but again, it's context specific, it's going to depend on uh, empirical information produced in discovery in, in the middle of the case. If that were shown, Joe, your, your example, I think it would certainly be much more difficult to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the person taking the content would have a much stronger argument under the fourth factor. Uh, of fair use. There's no question about that. Um, I'm not sure that it often shakes out that way, though. Um, I, I'm not. Well, I was, I'm sorry. Well, no, I, was just, I was just going to say on the empirical stuff, um, the Marburger paper goes through this analysis of how if you have uh, new businesses that are created just to aggregate content and they're selling advertising, they can, they can offer advertising at a better price than the newspaper companies that are uh, uh, have the payroll and all the expenses of the newsroom to actually gather the information and put it up on the web, and therefore when the aggregator can sell the, the ad space at, at a cut rate compared to what the newspaper company can sell the ad space for, it pushes the, all the cost of advertising down. Okay. Um, and, and if that, that is shown yeah. empirically, then it would cut the other. Yeah, and I think secondly on the empirical, uh, the FTC has been doing its um, hearings on the journalism industry 
a bunch of really smart people have put papers in there, economists have, uh, have done things. Google came and did something, put it in the record. And I think, although I, I'm not sure my number is exactly right, I think uh, someone said that there had been a study that had shown maybe 55 or 60 percent of Google News users um, were saying that they weren't clicking through beyond, you know, and so that they're staying on the Google site even though the link is offered. Um, and they're, um, uh, and they're, the ads they're seeing are the ads that Google um, is selling on its own site. Um, and then there are people in the industry who will tell you that even when they click through, right, the newspaper companies are having a really hard time monetizing because of all the other pressures that are keeping um, ad rates down. Um, I also just wanted to briefly res respond to Sam that I do understand the concern about um, giving a new tool to information producers and, and um, is there a fear that they would be sending demand letters um, to people telling them what you're doing is um, is unlawful and we're going to go after you and that ends up suppressing speech and that's a, obviously something that all of us in the First Amendment bar you know, would be a disaster if that's where this went. Um, you know, I would just mention that the media companies were an amicus um, uh, in the Motorola case, um, yeah. sub, you know, sub, not, not supporting the NBA. Yeah, against, yeah, they were, against, they were on the other yeah, side. Yeah, against the NBA, and they also did an amicus in the PGA case um, on the other side. So I do think it's an industry that is very uh, sensitive to um, anything that would, would suppress. It's a, it's a fair point, uh, but also, I mean, the, the fly on the wall case it illustrates the potential sort of way this can veer off is it might not just be the news organizations that are asserting the claims. There, there could, I mean, what, what happens if um, the political activist who takes the ACORN video starts asserting that you can't report that because, uh, because they, they originated those facts? I mean, I, I know it's a far-fetched thing, and again, there's a straw man aspect, but. One, I, I guess I have, I share that concern, and, and, and Bruce, you know I'm with you spiritually, certainly. Uh, I want to be with you doctrinally, um, but, but the, the, the question which I think Sam is getting at is, if you look at the fly in the wall case, um, there is considerable tension uh, with the First Amendment right of uh, any publisher, uh, established news organization, uh, blogger and seller in his or her underwear, uh, to report facts. Um, and, and I think that this decision, there's a lot in it. There's no question about it. Um, to those of you who are students here, I know in uh, April this time of year, the last thing you want to do is read another decision. <laughs> Especially an 88 page. It's very long. But the opinion really does not address in a meaningful way the First Amendment uh, considerations and, and the tension that exists between accurate, truthful reporting of factual information, uh, which is protected since... Um, I'm uh, thinking of Landmark Communications, Smith Florida. Daily Mail, Florida Star, um, even more recently, Bartnick Bart and v v uh, Bopper, as long as it's lawfully acquired. And uh, to the extent the hot news misappropriation doctrine presupposes an antecedent quasi-property right in factual news, how is that squared with the First Amendment? Well, and I think in, in, on the fly on the wall case, it's it's... Again, I'm not, I'm not on board with the reasoning of the entire decision. I agree with some of it, but not all of it, because again, from my perspective, um, you know, the <coughs> ultimate upgrading or downgrading of a stock in particular to me is in fact independent news, because whether or not the underlying analysis is correct, if Barclays says a stock is, you know, is going to go up, the stock's going to go up because, because they have such enormous market power. So to me, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely in agreement with the analysis on the ultimate decision of should that fact be protected. Now, the underlying analysis, I think, is a separate issue. I mean, what the think, firms did to come up with their right, recommendations, right, right, the exactly. underlying evaluative work and analysis. But copyright should go a long way to protecting that. Exactly, right. and and they could also protect it under contract principles. I mean, I one of the and again, well, I, I think I, I think that is. I, I think that's an important part of the opinion. But I think it is protected even under under established copyright law. Look at Justice O'Connor in the Feist case. She says this comes to the distinction between uh, creation and discovery, and certainly where you're talking about the underlying. Uh, investment analysis and the hard work done to crunch the numbers and come up uh, with a report and recommendation, to me, that's creation. Okay. But again, but again, that to me is an easy, in a sense, is an easy case on a number of levels in the sense that you know that there is an economic impact on the producer in that case. 
again, I keep coming back to, you know, for example, the case that we had. And, and you know, I, I'm, I am a, a trial lawyer, you know, sort of by vocation. And the reality is there's a practical problem with, with a lot of these issues. And that is, particularly in the context of a preliminary injunction or, as you see more and more courts doing these days, uh, an order for a trial within a month. I mean, initially when the, when the case was filed, Judge Young, it was filed on December 22nd, and Judge Young initially ordered us to be trial ready by January 5th. So we had to do all of our discovery, find our witnesses, find our experts, and get it all done within a week and a half over the Christmas and New Year's season. Um, he was we were just trying to write a blog post about the complaint before heading <laughs> off for Christmas break, as I recall. You guys had to, <laughs> to, to do the work in the case. And he, and you know, I mean, he ultimately took pity on us and put us off to the end of, of January. But, but there is this aspect of at that speed and dealing with new technology, coming to a conclusion and actually proving whether or not there is harm or is not harm, and what the economic impact of new technology is is virtually impossible, even in the hearings that are going on. There's been, a lot, there's been a lot of evidence submitted on both sides, and looking at it, I think there are good arguments on both sides, but I don't know that I can look at that evidence at the moment and say definitively, you can say what the economic impact is, and you may have looked at it more closely than I have, but I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Um, so, I mean, there is a practical problem in terms of the, the judicial system dealing with it uh, under these principles. I'm sorry. I was just saying, you think it's enhanced because of the injunctive remedies? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is, it, it's difficult Whereas because... Usually we do things, we assess usually damages Usually you assess after, damages yeah. sort of throughout the... Yes, absolutely. In terms, in terms of what courts are doing these days, they're moving cases, they're moving copyright and, case, copyright and trademark cases through very, very quickly, which I think is a good thing, but it does create some practical problems. Well, and fly on the wall, there was an injunctive remedy. You know, yeah. it's, I was, it was very narrow. narrow. It was very narrow, but there it was. You know, two hours, right, after... Two, two hours. hours. Yeah. I, you know, I think the fly on the wall case is a, it's a, it's a really interesting case, and I think it's a, um, in some ways it highlights, I think, I think, some of the concerns about misappropriation. Um, and misappropriation, it's just such a vague, kind of amorphous tort. Um, and so in some ways, I actually, you know, agree with Bruce uh, in the sense of, you know, as between a vague amorphous tort and something specific, right, if we had a federal statute that was na narrowly tailored, targeted, uh, I might be actually more comfortable with that because it would actually have, you know, hopefully exceptions and very narrow scope. Uh, what makes me more uncertain is really how judges have such discretion in kind of manipulating or applying the elements of misappropriation. What, I mean, uh, and final is a great example, right? Because um, there are a lot of kind of open questions about how it's applied. Um, uh, you know, INS is very clear in saying we don't create a property right in the news. We're just creating a quasi-property right, good as against direct competitors. Right. Um, big question, right? It's flying the wall a direct competitor. I mean, they're not a brokerage company. Uh, they are disseminating information. Are they more of a downstream kind of player like Google? Um, you know, it's kind of glossed over a little bit. Um, Isn't that the question you raised a couple minutes ago, Sam, with the line drawing between yeah, the qualifies? The line drawing. I mean, and uh, just to add on to that and to make the, the, the point about flying the wall is, isn't, aren't the banks going to now have to sue Bloomberg, too? If you look at the injunction, it actually says you've got a year to go sue everybody else that's doing this. Yeah. And so it's not just Fly. It's going to be the, the financial news uh, companies as well. And well, that's... No, I thought that was one of the most interesting aspects, that the injunction in the case is that Fly can apply to modify or vacate the injunction in a year in the event that it can demonstrate the firm Sparkley's at all have not taken reasonable steps to restrain the systematic unauthorized misappropriation of the recommend of their and, stock and, recommendations. And I, and I want to make a further point about INS, which is that there, I think there's this sort of difficulty or tension in trying to take INS as a case that was from 1918 and plug it into the world of fly on the wall, right? Uh, so much has changed the model of a top-down uh, gatekeeper. There are two competitors, and we are competitors, and INS competes with the AP, and it's all very clear in some way. That is, to me, that's just totally dissolved now. We, we, yeah. it, it, you can't tell who's a real yeah. competitor. I think, I think that's a really fascinating aspect of that opinion because INS versus AP is almost like the strongest example, right? They started with the strongest example, two competitors, head to head, uh, you know, clear story about what the public goods problem is. Um, and today, right, the world is so much more complex. Uh, there's much more downstream aggregation, upstream aggregation. 
Uh, it's not clear who's a competitor. Um, and, you know, kind of going back, I mean, anytime we can talk about a 1918 case, it makes the law professor's heart warm up because it's wonderful, sure. right? <laughs> uh, that's still relevant today. Um, but what I really would point to would be uh, Justice Brandeis's uh, dissent, uh, which I think, you know, even back in 1918, right, he's concerned about, uh, well, you know, how difficult it is to, for a judge to actually decide whether this is the right result. And that's in, like, the, the easiest case or the clearest case today, right? Um, imagine the same kind of concerns applying today. Yeah. The, the complexity, the difficulty, it's ten times more complicated. And Brandeis joined by Justice Holmes, by the way, mm -hmm. two dissenters, and, and there was no mention of the First Amendment in that case. Uh, and if you think about it historically, the development of free speech jurisprudence, I think the first United States Supreme Court precedent to address free speech in some of the World War I protest case, cases was decided the same year. Uh, 1918, I think, for what he does. At any point, pretty, pretty close in time. Yeah. Um, and they, they shared the concern uh, without dressing it up in First Amendment free speech language or, or giving a, a constitutional aspect mm -hmm. uh, that I think is being expressed by some of the uh, people on the panel. Today. Well, I was just going to add that they did say, at least Justice Brandeis did, that we, it's for the legislature. Yes. I mean, he didn't right. make that no. point that it, was, exactly. that it was for the legislature. Okay. Um, things have changed, things are the same. I, I know there's a law professor out there who's written a piece on the AP lobbying Congress for a hot news law in the 19th century, um, long before INS rolled along. So it is funny how some of these same issues kind of do come up when there are new, new technologies. Um, I would throw out um, that in the uh, Nation Harper and Row case, the Ford Memoir case, there was a First Amendment argument raised in that case. Um, and, the, and the Supreme Court there said that, um, that the, the First Amendment, the right to report a truthful information um, would give way to copyright. Now, they, of course, they make the point that what's because copyright doesn't cover it's facts. No, yeah. They say that, but I, but I do think it um, there is some appeal to this absolutist First Amendment position that um, uh, that in other contexts that I, I might be um, maybe more persuaded by that it would carry the day. But I think we do have some other. Uh, uh, bodies of law to work with that would suggest that it not, not in every case when there's another interest such as the interest in, well, in it, unfair I competition. The, I think what the decision ultimately points up is that copyright law and hot news misappropriation uh, protect very different legal interests. And um, copyright law protects originality and creative expression. Um, the hot news misappropriation doctrine, particularly as given expression in this decision, uh, is intended to protect at least in substantial part, the hard work and the effort uh, that goes into gathering a valuable commercial commodity only to have it stripped away by a competitor and handed out so that the person who did the work uh, to get it in the first instance is meaningfully deprived of its value. And, and I think that's the added ingredient that you get here um, that you certainly don't get in a copyright law case. And that is most clear, again, I think, in Justice O'Connor's decision in Feist, where she says, we don't really care about sweat of the brow. That's not what copyright law is all about. It is a very big part about hot news misappropriation. I don't, I don't know. It, 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 feels, it feels like uh, the, the fly on the wall case applies the hot news doctrine in a context that is, that is so different that, I, that I, so I wonder how far you can go with any applicability of the case in the future. I mean, it, fe it feels to me like the financial services business model is so different from what we're talking about. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you guys have a view other than, other than upholding the notion that hot news is alive and well. I wonder how far you can really apply the case. Is that because of the type of fact we're talking about? Because it's a subjective fact as opposed to the fact about my phone number and the street I live on? Well, it's, it's a number of different things to me. I mean, first of all, I have some question as to whether or not the hot news doctrine needs to be applied in, in this context to begin with because you're talking about a financial model um, that where they are providing service to a fairly limited number of customers. They've chosen to make that open. They could very easily have a license to use that information, to hear that information, and, and by contract, because they are actually dealing directly with everybody who gets that information, either it's their employees or it's their customers to whom they're actually having phone calls and, and there is a direct contractual relationship, you could write that into the contract that says you're not allowed to disclose this. They did. Yeah. Well, well, no. They, they actually they, they didn't they didn't write that into the contract. And I guess the question is then, 
They didn't write it into the contract with their employees. They, I mean, that, the decision says that, that, that the, both the employees and the clients were contractually bound not to disclose this information. I, thought, I, think, I think the decision says that the, that the employees were encouraged and told that they should not share it, but I, didn't, I, think, I thought it said that specifically that there was no contractual barrier. Um, I, but, 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 in any, but in any event, then the question becomes, let's assume for the moment that there was, in fact, a contract. Then you have somebody else that you can go after. Well, and they'd certainly breached the duty of confidentiality. I mean, that's sort of a... a yeah fiduciary duty, even if there wasn't a contractual duty, an employee that just And, and that, that's another yeah. aspect of the First Amendment uh, case, the fact you're talking about there, too, because I, I think implicitly uh, this judge uh, was not buying the proprietor of flyingthewalls.com testimony and explanation that he was going through a lot of effort to get this information from various sources. It sounds a lot like news gathering. When you read the those pages of the uh, decision, yeah. pages 33 and 34. He goes 34, to Bloomberg, he goes to the uh, chat room. Absolutely. It sounds just like what a reporter does. Yeah. Uh, but here, I think this this judge viewed this as uh, the fellow's name who ran fly on the wall uh, had all these relationships with sources inside the brokerage houses uh, who were illicitly giving him the information. And perhaps it was happening, or apparently it was happening, on such a systematic, uh, routinized basis that uh, the news gathering was no longer lawfully acquired. And, and I think that's pass it, and I think it's an important part of the case. Well, I have to confess that I have written one of these big bad demand letters in past years. <laughs> two fly on the wall. No, actually, two fly on the wall. Um, disclosed here for the first time. Um, we had a newsletter client, financial newsletter client, about four or five years ago, just pulling its hair out because fly on the wall within 10, 20, 30 seconds of a newsletter making a recommendation by email to its subscribers was putting the same recommendation on its own website. And particularly when the newsletter publisher was putting out uh, recommendations in small cap stocks where there was a lot of volatility, uh, their readers were complaining, saying that by the time I got your email, that today was the day to go buy XYZ Corp, it had already bumped up. And why it had bumped up? Because fly on the wall uh, had subscribe to the newsletter, and the minute they were getting the recommendations, they were putting them on their own website. It, so we did a hot news demand letter. Didn't take that long to do, because there's not that much hot news law. What, what took longer was finding where to send it, um, and, and who would fly, this was four or five years ago, who would fly on the wall would respond. As it turned out, um, um, they never responded, but they stopped doing what they were doing, and we discovered that they were a subscriber, and so we did, by our subscription agreement, Change. change the language. And so the publisher figured out what to do. Fly on the wall may be doing the same thing or may have been doing the same thing to other newsletter publishers, but decided in this case not to. Well, you know, fly on the wall also <laughs> is another Another atmospheric that really impacted this decision. You're coming to me uh, saying you didn't copy, uh, commit copyright infringement, but you sued someone who did the same thing to you and the same thing on the commercial hot news misappropriation mm -hmm. claim. That unquestionably colored the judge's right, decision. Right, right, yeah, and, and, right. And hurt fly on the wall's credibility as a litigant. Yeah. Yeah, but again, it highlights just how malleable this doctrine is and how far away we are now from INS versus AP, right? Now we're a long way away from INS versus AP. Well, and to that point, I guess, Bruce, what would a, a hot federal hot news statute say? What, what it, In a couple of respects, what would it say is, is news, is a fact that is covered? And the second piece, thinking back to this injunction about a certain number of hours after it's published, would a hot news statute actually say um, one can't publish hot news within X number of hours, minutes, seconds? Well, we had talked about just codifying the Motorola factors. And I've seen some proposals out there. Um, there was a law review article where someone said maybe you amend the, the copyright statute to give news gatherers 24 hours some, you know, I think I think the, that really, as Joe was saying earlier, takes away from the discretion of the trial judges too much. That if you have the Motorola factors, you well, at least have something that a court can. I mean, incidentally, I, it, the on the Motorola factors, they do look very specific in some way. 
Um, but it's a great article Richard Posner wrote Posner. in our, the misappropriation of dirge. He's like, are you kidding? This isn't. This doesn't tell us anything. You can you can fill this up with whatever you like, especially the important one, which is the fifth factor about mm -hmm. is this is this an activity that's going to kill the incentive to engage it's in well, the activity. In the next sense, right? Flying the wall actually applied the top news factors, right? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Just I mean, the list. right. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think she showed Judge Coates showed how how malleable that, that that fifth factor is because I mean. Is it really the case that fly on the wall is what was undermining Barclays and, and all these big investment banks at the same time that there was the global uh, uh, settlement that was s separating the, the, the equity research from the, um, from the other side of their businesses and then plus all the economic problems in the economy in general? There are tons of things she could have pointed to and said, this isn't the reason that they're you know, slowing down on their equity research. I mean, come on, give me a break. Um, but you know, maybe their name didn't help them too much. That they were. <laughs> um, we're representing a newsletter the publisher now called Pirate Investor, and so we're um, wondering about that name, that name issue too. Um, well, they had all that like kind of bragging advertising on the site. You know, it, yeah, it same kind of. Yeah, yeah. I guess I circle back to something we talked about very early on, and I'm glad David did some sort of definitional stuff, because when I was looking at the title of this panel, the, the word news aggregate, where's news aggregation, means so many things to so many different people. I was, read a lot of articles about this stuff, and you'll hear, hear people talk about news aggregation, and then cite statistics about websites that copy whole articles and post them online, which I, I don't think most people would argue is a problem. It's a pretty straightforward copyright situation, obviously. That's sort of piracy, but I think that the, the paradigm news aggregation thing we all think about is the headline in the first couple lines in the story. And to move from news misappropriation to back to copyright law, um, there's, I guess, two arguments to have about, about this issue. It, there's the fair use issue, is lifting the headline and the lead, is that, um, is that a fair thing to do? But before you even get to that, you have to determine, is it infringing? And is there, is there any ar argument to be made about the protectability of headlines and leads to begin with? Is there, you know, we, we all have this doctrine nailed into our heads that short phrases and titles are typically not protectable. Um, any thoughts on that from a copyright perspective? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think, I think Mike is exactly right. It depends on the context right. a lot, right? You can imagine a range of different cases. Uh, you know, a single headline, a single sentence from a lead, uh, you know, uh, either too short to be uh, copyrightable or not infringement or not, you know, or fair use, right? But when you, once you start talking about aggregations, right, um, uh, and the selection and the arrangement of the headlines, uh, a whole series of them, uh, then I think there is, uh, you know, quite a decent um, cause of action for a copyright. Right? Yeah, I think at that point you you can plausibly make the argument that uh, when when it's that far reaching, um, that you have the, the creative contribution that journalists and editors uh, and newspaper writers make every day in deciding. Uh, what news to cover and what to present uh, to their readers. And I think there is a much uh, a collective good that inures to the benefit of society through that process. If that is somehow taken away uh, or usurped in a meaningful way, then you're really almost intruding on the editorial discretion and function of a news organization. Yeah, but, no, but the, the closer call, and, I, and you know, Dave, you and I have been <laughs> uh, We spent and, a lot of time I guess together. This, <laughs> is, this, is, this is the time in the discussion where I should acknowledge, you know, I'm, I'm thankful we don't have to scream at each other in front of a stenographer anymore. Uh, but, you know, it, one, one headline uh, and an accompanying lead. Um, I still think you can credibly take the position that, or the answer in my mind would be, Chris, it depends. Uh, we're all aware uh, of uh, the titles and short phrases issue. Um, and there is a line of cases uh, in candor that's problematic for copyright protectability uh, applying that doctrine. Um, the merger doctrine as well. But I think the applicability of the merger doctrine depends on the specific content of the headline. To me, there's a very big difference between uh, publishing, um, I guess I'll take the first game from this week, Red Sox 987, uh, <laughs> or New York City is bankrupt, as opposed to Ford to City, drop dead. I mean, to right. me, the latter is unquestionably creative expression that merits some degree of copyright protection, along when accompanied with a lead, uh, which any journalism professor, any working journalist is going to tell you about the hours of journalism school, learning to craft uh, sentences that will invite the reader in and their creative expression. Um, I think at that point, you can make a very credible argument that they're subject 
uh, to in deserving of copyright protection. I know this is going to shock you, but I disagree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, think, I think an argument can be made that in a perfect world that should be protectable. Um, I think it's difficult to make the, the argument that under the, the current copyright regime that it is protectable. That, I mean, ultimately, I don't think that there is any dispute that there can be creativity that goes into uh, a headline, that there can be creativity that goes into a lead. I think, I think everybody would, would agree that, that that can be the, the case, and there can be you know, headlines that are, again, you know, Red Sox 10, Yankees 1, and that's, you know, not particularly crazy. When was that? I don't remember. Uh, no, well, you know, leave me alone, okay? <laughs> uh, I can dream. Um, but in terms of the protectability of the headline, I keep coming back to what is the work? You know, and the work is the article. Um, and so, the, the, you know, the, the work is not, in essence, that the headline. And, and there is a fairly established line of cases that, that says that, you know, short phrases, titles, leads, uh, par pardon me, take the, the, the headline first, that, that titles are not protectable. Now, maybe there is a, um, you know, a public policy argument that that should no longer be the law, but from my point of view, I, I think it is the law. The leads, I think, is, is a more interesting question. Um, and then you do get into the merger doctrine, and, and again, if you follow the case law that has been out there, you know, and the Nihon case um, out of out of New York, you know, in which, you know, you had thousands of articles that that had been um, copied or or summarized and translated and, and largely done verbatim, and the court had held that only in about 56 of them, I think, where uh, where more than half of the article was copied, could you really state a claim for copyright infringement and. You know, there's a, there's a fairly substantial line of cases that I think it's, it's difficult to overcome with respect to um, whether or not it is, in fact, um, a copyright violation. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I don't think it's been definitively decided, and it would have been If you can fun. show me a case that says definitively uh, headlines are not subject to copyright protection, I'd like to see it. I haven't yet. I'd, no, I'd no, like titles, titles, and, and I can show you lots of First Circuit case law. That uh, that and Second Circuit case law that, that actually identifies a headline as the title to an article, um, and that's the language that's that's used, and that's the language that. But isn't it words. always context? I mean, doesn't it? In oh, some always. sense, it always, always. got to be context specific because isn't the question? It's a is it original enough? Right. To meet the threshold. I mean, right. I mean, I, I I take your point on the infringement. If you're gonna, if we're looking at the work at a whole, and you're just taking the title, maybe it's never going to be infringement just to take the title, but couldn't it, in terms of protectability? Sure. No, because the, the, the argument is, the next step, along with what I've already said, is that by taking the headline in accompaniment, accompaniment with the lead and presenting it to the reader, uh, you are taking away what is essentially the most important two senses of the work, which is, you know, get you into the nation, the heart of, uh, the, heart of the work type of argument. Now, if, if in a given case, I'll come back to the point that Bruce made. The, the empirical evidence, the information adduced in discovery, is going to show that in a given case, 65%, I think was the number you used, Bruce, uh, of readers don't click through to the underlying article. To me, I think that is going to, in a real-world litigation way, cross-pollinate the copyright protectability issue in, in the mind of the judge. Well, it may be. I mean, I, I don't know. It's having, having come up with... I think that there is creativity in coming up with all titles, uh, book titles, you know, titles to articles, titles to, and yet, again, you have this very established line of case law that says that says titles are not protectable. So, uh, and again, you know, we can the the lead issue I think is far more fact specific, and I think that, that there is a potential argu argument there, and obviously that's an argument that we've gone back and forth on, and and it's a fascinating no, I mean it's a, it is a fascinating yeah. issue uh, because because at what point do you cross that line where you're outside of the merger doctrine, and are you now arguing the fair use issues? Yeah. Um, First, I'm gonna let you finish, then actually Amr is gonna run a microphone around questions. and I know we've got a lot like of people. you do that. agree that your dream headline is Red Sox 36, Yankee 0? We can agree on that. Okay. My, my one question for both of you is um, Hot News was not available in Massachusetts. Is that right? I think that's, yeah. There's, a, there's an unfair competition in Massachusetts law. Yeah. I mean, did you feel that it would have been a better fit analytically for the case um, if it had been? Yeah, I mean, 
Without going, I mean, we, we saw clarification, sought clarification on whether or not a hot news claim was being asserted. Um, and the, the well, I think there's enough substantive overlap with the Massachusetts uh, unfair competition law that essentially you get to the same protection, the same bundle of, yeah. of rights. So different denomination. I think you end up in the same place. Yeah, Chapter 93A is, you can 93. fit almost anything in Chapter 93A. <laughs> right, yeah, uh, although, yeah, I mean, I, my understanding was that, that it was, that, and again, it was your claim, so, <laughs> uh, was, was that it was 93A, but not in the hot news sense, and, and who knows, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I absolutely think, and it's, and it's interesting because, you know, one thing that we haven't addressed at all is, We've got all of these problems, and we're just addressing this under U.S. law. When you get when you get into the international sphere, it, it becomes a nightmare, because you know. And the reality is, all of this has an international component because the internet doesn't stop at our border. Um, and you know, I mean, fair use is not recognized in in the European system, and so copyright claims are far easier to substantiate over there. Um, you know, you've got one case in. Japan that actually, while they didn't call it a hot news case, they actually sort of applied functionally the the, the standards or a, a hybrid of the standards that uh, are used under the hot news doctrine. So, you know, once we once we resolve how we think we could tr we should treat it, then then you've got the problem of how are we going to convince everybody else in the world to abide by the rules that we we think are the right rules. Um. Open this up to questions. Um, Amr, if you want to bring the microphone around, you want to make it run all the way over here. But, or, or thanks, Amr. Let's start here with that one. Thank you. Um, an observation and then a question. Um, the observation was about the empirics on the click through rate from Google News to a website. And um, whatever the percentage is, I, I would love to see the baseline comparison to the number of people who turn the page on a newspaper to finish the story, or whatever the appropriate breakpoints would be. In other words, we know that there's a degradation of interest in any particular story um, as uh, people uh, consume it, and therefore we have to baseline it against behavior in other media. Um, but the question I have, and this is really, I think, throughout the entire panel, the, something that we, we nibbled at, but I don't know that we hit the nail on the head. It's a difference between news gathering and what I call curation, where the organization of particular things that everyone else, the, the information that's already known and available, but not organized in a particular fashion. To what extent is curation news gathering? And if it isn't the same thing, then is there a reason why we should be more or less favorable towards curation? <laughs> It's a really uh, interesting point, and I think um, you know it does go to this question of uh, you know I, if you go to the fly on the wall case, right? Um, the judge talks about how what fly on the wall is doing is adding no value. Right? All they're doing is uh, you know reporting these facts, gathering it, uh, and then spitting it out, and doing no work on their own. And I think your question goes to exactly that, right? Uh, is that really true? Right? Are they really doing? Um, or are they doing a real value in collecting this information, disseminating it? Um, in some sense, right, Google does no more than simply collect stuff, right? Um, but they have enormous value. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, this idea of, um, kind of gathering things, uh, gathering, curating, uh, selecting, um, there really is a lot more building than maybe people uh, otherwise you know, think about. And this just shows up in the fair use context when you talk about copyright, right, in uh, the first factor, uh, in the Perfect 10 case, in uh, you know, the, the Kelly versus Rebusoft case, where uh, you know, the courts acknowledge that there can be some value from uh, these more literal forms of copy. And so uh, I, I'd be you know, sympathetic to that kind of argument. I, I would just jump on ju just to uh, I would jump on to that the opinion. I think it's going to come in the first factor of fair use a lot this issue, and uh, my sense is it's a productive public interest use uh, of the information, and that it should receive a, some recognition. Yeah, just to back up, okay. just yeah. I, 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 I think yeah. the, the value added function of what Fly on Wall was doing to my way of looking at this was marginal. No, so I'm yeah, yeah, no, and I, and I totally would, I would agree on the facts of fly on the wall, but the way we need to think about it is there are other sites, other journal, journalism-oriented sites, new modes of journalism that could rely yeah. no, on if, if what you mean by, by curatorial function is uh, what I conceive of as the typical blog model, where 
uh, somebody's looking at, at something, an article, and then says, hey, here's what so-and-so says today in such and such a place. Here's a, a link to the underlying article. Here's what I think. Here's where I disagree. Here's where I agree. Here's where I think this is valuable. Uh, is that fair use? To my mind, absolutely. And I think there's very, very much value added there. You could also imagine a site that's sort of um, a subject matter oriented site that yeah. curates sure. all stuff about yeah. global warming. Yeah. And they aggregate it all and they use robots. I, I agree. You, or, you know, you I, I think it's a, a bit of a harder call. Yeah, but, but I think it's, it's all like it's, it's protected. Yeah. Um, but but let, let's say, for example, uh, if anybody watched the end of the Masters last night, where um, during the press conference, uh, when Tiger, Wood, Tiger Woods is facing the audience just like we are, uh, he got one difficult question uh, from a reporter who was not identified by her surname. Her first name was Christine. I think it was Christine Brennan for Brennan. USA Today, yeah. um, who brings a very unique gender perspective to a lot of her sports commentary, and I think it's tremendously valuable. Uh, what if the Huffington Post uh, starts putting up uh, a list of her columns, headlines, and links. Uh, here's the last five or six from Christine Brennan. Uh, is that fair use? Um, I have serious misgivings about whether that, that example would qualify as fair use. I know that's a significant departure from what was implicit in your question. Uh, but it takes us back to the definition, the threshold definition of what is news aggregation. Well, and your, your second question plays back into sort of an implicit question in your first comment, which is, which is, again, what's the value that's added back to the people whose information is sort of curated? Take, for example, you know, a, a Drudge Report. You know, there are, he's obviously established essentially what is a trademark-driven um, business where people go to him because he has a particular point of view and he gathers articles that people feel will fit his fit their <coughs> point of view or that they disagree with or that they are interested in you know what's interesting to me again on the damages issue is um, you know if only you know if 65 percent don't click through how does how has the total pie grown in terms of people who are now aware of an article that they otherwise never would have would have come across and so even though, you know, X percentage don't click through, the numbers are so much greater who now have been shown that, that the, that the overall traffic grows enormously for uh, an article that's on a site that you know, normally doesn't get that kind of traffic. That, to me, is why the damages issue is so tricky, tricky to deal with and the, and the issue of what are the incentives and, and what is the actual impact. I'd love to get your perspective, Bruce. I know you touched on this a little bit, actually, in the Washington Post piece. That you yeah, I was just going to add to that, that uh, just a bit, that sure, the, the curatorial function is an incredibly important one. And nobody can imagine what the internet would be like without companies that do that for us. And I think what, what Bruce Sanford and I have tried to do is just argue that that's part of it, but it's not all of it, and that we have to have some public policy that also uh, incentivizes people to create or there won't be anything left to, to curate. Um, it's, and it's amazing how quickly, right, I mean, this is just a self-evident thing, how quickly all these changes have come upon the industry. But for me, um, I always think back about the Unabomber, that when he wanted his manifesto published, the most important places in the world to get that in were the full of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And 10 or 15 years later, we know he would put it someplace else on the web, and it wouldn't be in those places. And those, those spots where our cultural and political conversation used to take place have changed dramatically. And we, we believe that we need to find a way to harness public policy to, um, to keep journalism viable as it transitions online. And frankly, I think the DC Circuit striking down uh, the FCC's authority on net neutrality um, maybe could give a boost to all of this because now we're told that the agency we thought regulated broadband um, doesn't have authority for that. And so we need to evaluate the infrastructure side of, of the internet and maybe along with it we'll think a little bit about the content side. Uh, do you see any of the doctrines that you have been discussing this morning as providing a solid foundation for um, sustainable business models, particularly in digital journalism? That's the big question, I guess. <laughs> Anyone have thoughts on that? Well, I'll just throw this out um, from having talked to someone about it recently. Um, uh, Washington should be in a 
um, in a mode of a great newspaper war um, because the Albritton family uh, that had owned the um, Washington Star that closed many years ago um, is set to launch a new web-only site for local journalism to challenge the Washington Post. And All Britain now being run by the son of the man who challenged the Graham family years ago um, is poaching talent from the, the Post and gearing up for this great uh, challenge uh, to take the paper head on on the web. And um, I know that some people who've looked at the business model for the web only uh, publication that All Britain intends to um, launch very soon have said that it doesn't work. Um, that the only reason that Politico has worked was because Politico had a print newspaper still to distribute and that it was able to tap into um, a, a lucrative advertising base for companies that, and interest groups that wanted to have the, the print presence and they're still able to command higher rates in print. Um, but when you take that away and when you look at what All Britain plans to do just on the web, just doing local news, uh, not charging for it, and hoping that advertising will support it, um, they say it's not a business, that there's no way it can succeed. Presumably someone thinks it's going to succeed if they're doing it. Well, you know, right, and so you, know, you make bold statements like that and then you learn to regret them, but, um, but I've talked to some people who've been closely involved in the development of the site who, and who were thinking about um, jumping over to join and have found that, that that model of being on the web, being for free, uh, not having a print counterpart to help subsidize uh, you on the advertising side um, is not going to work. And is that, and just to bring it back to the question, is that because do we think of, if that's true of the hot news misappropriation and copyright laws as they exist today? Or? Well, I think, again, if the, if the industry was able to collaborate in some kind of online uh, pricing to finally be able to put up paywalls, um, that might help. Um, I think, um, um, however, there are some projections that show even if you were able uh, to charge for content at the upper end of what projections might be, it still wouldn't replace uh, the advertising that you're losing to the search portals and other, other uh, companies on the internet. Um, but that if you had some of these other tools, maybe you would finally be able to equalize the relative ability to, to monetize your site. Um, I, just a, a, a different observation. Um, Clay Shirky, uh, who's a, a scholar in the field of, sort of trying to deal with what, what we do about journalism's future, has the, uh, what I find to be just a very convincing argument about um, the crisis that newspapers uh, and other news organizations are undergoing right now um, and uh, whether or not you buy the specifics of his argument, um, he, he, he makes a proposal for sort of what the way forward could be, um, not necessarily for newspapers but for journalism, right? If we get back to sort of the function and the social good we're worried about um, and his view Again, you know, it's not the only view, it's one view, is that we need lots of experimentation. We need not, lots of experimentation by relatively small players um, that, that, that rather than uh, sort of a save of, of the incumbent larger players. Uh, again, obviously, people on this panel will dispute that. But for the sake of argument, if the way forward is this sort of aggressive experimentation, small players, I think tightening uh, or, or you know, um, expanding copyright protection, e expanding, extending things like hot news protection can only put a damper on that type of experimentation. That's my two cents. Yeah, uh, my, my impression from talking to you know, people in the industry is to some degree it's, it's less the, um, the legal regimes that are available that are causing the problem and more Figuring out really how to monetize online content, and and to, to, you know, I, I my own personal view is the tools are there. Certainly, if you combine all of the theories that we've talked about, you know, all the different regimes that we've talked about today, the question is even with those, you know, with so much free content being available out there, is it is it going to be you know how much can you monetize it, um, and is it going to sustain the infrastructure that's necessary? to produce good, reliable news reporting. 
try and get a couple more questions in. Anyone? I wanted to go back to the fly in the wall decision for a minute. Um, when I read the decision, it struck me as odd that um, the judge kept on citing to Wainwright um, and then decided the case on a hot news uh, stance. And it seemed to me that one, it would have been a lot easier just to apply Wainwright to the facts of fly in the wall, um, especially because of the parallels to Castle Rock and maybe these facts aren't really facts, they're created by an author. You know, it's not a fact that the stock's gonna reach 350. Um, you know, it's someone's opinion. And then uh, combined with that, I'm wondering <clears throat> if it's a good idea to have hot news and copyright overlap. And if copyright applies, then shouldn't that just automatically preempt um, hot news, especially on the last factor? Because you could sue uh, under copyright theory, so there's really no uh, danger to, you know, your, your underlying work. A couple things about that. I think um, I think it is interesting that the status of those particular facts, right? Because there's a whole line of copyright cases that deal with these so-called created facts. Uh, so, like the uh, estimate of a car price or the estimate of a you know how, what a coin should sell in the kind of collector's market, um, and it raises all these kind of metaphysical questions: or is it really a fact? Is it not a fact? How do we treat it? Uh, and so there are cases out there that do provide some protection for these isolated facts. I think that they're wrongly decided. I think they're really problematic, but they're out there. And so uh, the court could have gone that direction. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, that she didn't. Um, on the issue of you know, the overlap between um, copyright and hot news, that raises the issue of preemption, as you know, right? Um, and um, you know, preemption is a really complicated subject in copyright. Uh, it's another one of these really fuzzy areas. Uh, I think the Second Circuit and the Motorola case, right, it's the most kind of thorough discussion of the interaction between those two fields, and I think they do do, a, you know, I think a pretty good job of kind of trying to carve out a narrow uh, preemption uh, sort of doctrine. Um, but, and, and so if you can find something in that field, I think the preemption concerns are less, but as you start expanding on misappropriation, start applying it to things that are beyond that narrow scope, uh, I think you do raise uh, real issues about um, preemption, right, uh, especially after FICE. I'd like to ask as many of you who want to to respond to a hypothetical. The hypothetical is uh, you're in the office of the CEO of your client. Your client is a major news organization. Say, just for example, News Corp. And uh, the, the uh, CEO says, I'm so tired of Google taking all our stuff and using it, and we're not getting any money for it. I want to sue them. Do you think I should do it? <laughs> they want to represent News Corp. Is this a bad hypothetical, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Am I going to get to try the case? <laughs> I, I think I'll, I'll take a stab at it, although I, I'd love to take the case. Right. Uh, um, and, I, and I note that even Google News has engaged, I understand, in some licensing agreements with uh, news content providers, including AP. Um, I think where you end up to answer that question, you really have to address in a kind of foundational way uh, what transformative use means under fair use analysis, uh, especially, particularly, in the context of uh, the internet search function. Um, I think if you go back and look at the Perfect 10 v. Google case, uh, which is really the linchpin that most people uh, engaged in news aggregation in the broad sense, uh, view as giving them uh, the ability to do that without running afoul of the copyright law. Um, I think that bundles together a, a number of things. And I know we're running short on time. I'd have to give you a long answer. But long and short of it is, I, I, and I know this is going to be in probably an unpopular view, uh, but I think the Google case there, uh, there was a great deal of result-oriented nature to that decision. Um, I think that uh, certainly, at that point in time, the court viewed uh, Google is not really a news content originator. Um, I think that it's one thing to say uh, the, the company that is a, performs this societal index, indexing function contributes meaningful social value by allowing new information to be located on the Internet. Um, 
okay, I get that, I can accept it within the context of that case. I think there are limits on exporting that rationale to other news aggregators um, because uh, there, it's a, and also Google is user-generated content. You know, the user is the one who initiates the search. I think it's a different thing, especially if it's a competing news organization, to select information from your competitor and then present that in some sort of aggregated format. Um, so the long story short is I think if you're going after Google, um, given the Perfect Ten case on transformative use as held in that case, uh, it's probably a difficult argument. But I would say that that rationale, as I hope I've uh, made somewhat clear, doesn't necessarily translate uh, to other news aggregation contexts. I would just jump in. Um, sure, I'd sue them. I'd, I'd sue them. <laughs> um, they, said they do settle most of their cases. So. Um, and there's a reason when they've been sued, I think, that they settle. We'll see if the one in New York settles. In the end, if the consent decree is approved, you could sue them under two theories. You could sue them as an aggregator. Um, and you could sue them as a cacher, right, because they store the full copies um, in their server, which powers their search functions. So you have the aggregator theory and you have um, the, the cache theory. Um, and, you know, as we've heard today, there are just a few cases out there, and we've picked over them as best we can, but, but there's not a lot of precedent yet. I think that um, particularly on the cache side, um, Google would be horrified to lose a case like that because it really powers their whole business model, right? They can go out onto the web and, and copy everything. And, well, you've got to put up a robot's text file if you don't want to be a part of that. And um, when I've spoken about this issue, that's what everyone always says. Well, it's, it's simple. Google makes it easy for you. Um, just put up the text file, and then you're out. Okay, um, a company that has its own foreign policy, right? as people were saying a couple weeks ago about Google in China, um, is, a, is a company that even a powerful news corporation on its own really doesn't have leverage with. Not even an industry has leverage with Google. And I think one of the real disconnects we have in the, our policy, right, is that we've passed laws to enable companies like Google to grow because they have all the safe harbors. Um, but we really haven't given content producers the leverage to be able to um, bargain with Google um, in order to extract some kind of, of real revenue sharing with the money that Google makes off the advertising from the content that all of us put on the web and pretty much have no choice but to give Google for free. And the few licensing agreements they have are with wire services that don't really have their own websites that they commercialize and they keep their content hosted on Google's website. And so that's where you've got the licensing agreements. But I think if someone fired a shot at Google, it would get all of us thinking more about how it is that we try to rebalance the playing field a little bit with that company. Um, I have a couple comments on that. One, um, on the cash arguments, a really interesting argument, but it would, and it would have a serious impact on what Google does. I wonder, though, under the fair use analysis, um, whether I, I don't see much effect on the market. Uh, I'm not sure how that their caching of, of that information affects the market negatively for the for the original work. In fact, it probably uh, improves the market for the original work. And that leads to my second point, which is you spoke about this leverage that Google has, um, and I'm not quite sure what I understand about that, except that. It seems to be an unwillingness to not use Google's services, right? I mean, it's not like Google is strong-arming you into taking positions that you don't want to take or um, uh, robbing you in some way. It's just that they're, it's an unwillingness to, to not make use of their search function, um, which I think cuts, uh, it cuts against. Uh, well, I think the reality is that there is one search engine on the planet that matters, and it's Google. And even though you can opt out of Google, um, you know, you could have opted out of AT&T 30 years ago and just not had telephone But doesn't service. that mean they're helping your business, not hurting it? Um, right? if, if you won't, if you can't opt out because it would be so damaging, then they're helping you. And then, well, I, so how do we can get go over, I would them. love to continue helping to have this discussion. <laughs> for a couple, two more minutes. Yeah, we're I mean, what I would just say is that I mean, this is how the world developed, right? The net came along. Um, Google in 98 starts doing what it does so well, right? It's an incredibly innovative company full of really, really smart people. 
And the journalism business thinks that, well, this is the way to go. You're on the web for free. Um, Google will point readers to your site. Um, you'll find a way to make money when all, those, when all that traffic comes to your site. And that's how you'll transition to the online world. And then what's happened 10 years later, uh, once this norm is out there, and it's, it's the way the internet is built, and um, we, we've grown accustomed to it, it's easy to use, we can find information fabulously quickly on the web, but that the newspaper companies and the journalism organizations have found that, well, we're really not monetizing. Um, and, you know, 40% of all online advertising is going to Google. That's in the Kennelletta book. And you really have no choice, even Mr. Murdoch may have no choice, um, but to, to leave open the door to Google because when, you, when you're 67 or 68% of the market share for search, you really have no choice. And there are hundreds of media companies trying to figure out, is there any way to get this one company to, um, to find a way to compensate for the value of the journalism that's put on the site? And I have to say, one thing to me that's so interesting about the way Google is covered as a company, right, is that there's just huge boosterism in the press for Google. I mean, the newspapers love Google. When Murdoch came out and said, well, maybe I'll close the door on Google, the New York Times had a story on the front page of the business section that read like an obituary um, for the Internet, that Google was going to change, uh, that Murdoch was going to change the way the Internet um, uh, works for all of us. I found interesting the other day, there was an article about Google translation services. And I'll, Chris, I promise I'll wrap it up. Um, <laughs> and you know, the article made the point that online translation is now an area that Google is going into. And that there's a paragraph that said, once Google's uh, brain power is applied to this new problem of translation on the web, you know, who knows what kind of products will develop from it. Well, what I want to know is why that brain trust at Google um, also can't figure out a fair way to help the companies that build their cash for them and therefore built their business for them because there would be no advertising for Google if there wasn't content going into Google to find a way to share the revenue that they get from the advertising. Can you, can you separate the search function from the Google News? I mean, I think of it as Google News as being the real problem, and I think of, of the search function as probably really actually driving traffic to sites, whereas there's a better argument, whether or not a sufficient argument, that Google News is really a more of a more of a of a potential competitor. Well, I think that that's exactly right. But I do feel that even with the search function, Google is able to captivate us the way it does because we know when we sit down into this and type in something into the search box that we're pretty much getting the world of knowledge. And you know, it may be that there is a challenge in figuring out how to quantify the value that journalism creates for Google uh, in some precise quantitative way. When Eric Schmidt wrote in the Wall Street Journal recently, he said, guys, uh, this was after Murdoch had come out with his um, shot across the bow, you know, um, you don't really add that much to Google. That most people go online to search for products. They're buying a toaster or a Kleenex right. or something. What is, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, you know, that's the company's answer, really, right? Um, and I think that, um, uh, that same brain power, the brain trust to Google that can solve problems like online translation services, I think could also come up with some algorithms to figure out what kind of value and goodwill they get um, from being the repository for journalism. It, 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 I, I think we're going to... We may get an answer to some of this. There was just a class action filed against Google yesterday right. or the day before mm -hmm. uh, by a group of independent photographers based on the Google Library mm -hmm. project. So. Uh, we'll see if this gets litigated all the way through. I think we have to wrap it up, unfortunately, because this is great. We'll continue it over lunch. Joseph, Bruce, David, Sam, Mike. When Mike's kids watch this on the internet radio, your, your dad did not make a fool of himself, which is good. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. We're going to walk down that way, I assume.